Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon to your assessors. Good afternoon, Mr. Simpkins. Uh, one issue I'd just like to go back on, which I rather skipped over um, before the lunch break. Um, in paragraph 23 of your witness statement, no need to turn it up, you say the issue was not merely a matter of individual errors, but rather the underlying complexity and fragility of the branch accounting system. Can you explain in more detail what you mean by that, please? Um, I, mean, I, th I think for people who are not IT professionals, if I could use that term, there can be this sort of um, a naivety, you know, that a, a fault in a computer system is um, just a, a programming error, you know, a an error in a line of program code. And that, that creates a bug or a fault in the system. And um, someone just needs to identify that bug and fault and go into the program and correct it and all will be well. Um, I, might, I could say more about that subject, but it starts to get a little bit more technical. But in, in computer systems, you, you have problems that are not just individual coding errors. You can have problems arising from the design of the system. Um, and <laughs> difficult to know quite how to explain this in non-jargon terms, but um, the, the, the result is that the, this, the system is vulnerable to ongoing Errors. Perhaps, perhaps, a way, perhaps I could say it like this. As I've already explained, and you know, you know, we tested Horizon for nearly 12 months, and a lot of corrections had to go through the system to fix all different kinds of errors. Now, in a computer program, you get if you get a lot of errors in a computer program, you're rewriting large sections of code, and um, you're adding to the complexity of that code. Um, and, in, and in fixing some lines, you're possibly disturbing other lines. So if, if you keep making changes to a piece of code because there's just some basic way it's not working, you end up with a fragile piece of software. It's like any piece of technology. You know, if you keep patching it, you get to the point where you say, this is ridiculous, you know, I just need to throw, away and throw it away and start again. You know, it, it gets to a state of fragility. So, and, and, and if you keep getting problems, so, you know, as I identified, you know, in those phases of testing around Christmas 1998, if you keep getting repeated errors in, in a part of a subsystem, you, you think about redesigning it. You know, if you're spending hours and hours trying to work out why it's going wrong, you think, would well, something with the original specification or something with a programmer who did this it's just it's just a mess you know so it'll be better to redesign it and start again so i don't feel i've explained that very well but, but it, you it, it's not just a matter of finding individual coding errors you you get to a point where the basic design is wrong so i would say within the epos system there was some basic misconceptions as to how it had to work as an accounting system. So, I'd, I mean, I don't know the background to that. Misconceptions by who? Well, by the original requirements gathering process, the original systems analysis, the original systems design. You know, it's as though people didn't realise that when you had an accounting transaction, it had to generate a debit and a credit somewhere. You know, it wasn't just a matter of, oh, great, we processed the sale of a stamp. No, so when you process the sale of a stamp, what debit and credit transactions does that generate? And where are they generated in the system? And if, if people are not clear where those accounting processes are taking place and where that balancing activity is being done in the system, you've got a design flaw. You see what I mean? That's a kind of a design flaw. You're, you, you're not clear on how the accounting flows are going to work through the system in order to ensure that everything balances at the end of the day. And that's what 
you know, right back from that position in late 1998, where I was concerned about the the accounting functionality within the system. It's not just because I thought, you know, there's a few lines of wrong programming code here. It's because I thought someone hasn't thought through a robust design how this is going to work in the future, you know, with loads of offices, loads of transactions. Is that... Thank you. Is that good enough? You mentioned in late um, 98 your concern, and you mentioned... Uh, as an example, a problem with the um, EPOS system. Were you aware of the setting up of the uh, so-called EPOS task force and a report produced um, by the EPOS task force? No. I think it was... I mean, I, you've sent me some documentation on it, and I think it was an entirely pathway activity. And... Can we look at that documentation? Yes. Yep. Um, uh, FUJ 3080690. A document which, um, with which um, the chair and others are very familiar now. Ignore the date in the top right hand side mm. and treat this as being created in late 98. Um, is it right that the first time you saw this is when the inquiry disclosed yes. it to you recently? Yes. I think you've read um, the document. Yes. Uh, were you aware that the task force, so-called, had been set up? No. No, this is part of the, the general problem of not having visibility of what pathway are doing, you know, inside the black box the, the, of their development. Uh, on um, reading it and the concerns um, that it sets out, um, is this information that you think ought to have been shared? Well, you, you can see the dates here, August, September 1998. So we are still at a relatively early stage of testing. I mean, I, I didn't become clear, as I said earlier in my evidence, that, that, how, that there were serious problems in this area until about October, late October, certainly into November. So, but Pathway are, are clearly, no, at this time, August, you know, August, well, but obviously before August the 19th, that the EPOS system is not functioning robustly. Um, you know, <coughs> they're, getting a lot of, they're getting a lot of errors, pinnacles in it, and so what are they going to do about it? If we skip forward, please, to page seven. Uh, the line, it's clear that senior members of the task force are extremely concerned about the quality yeah. of code in the EPOS product. Um, there was a re-engineering by Isha. Since then, many hundreds of pinnacle fixes have been applied to the code, and the fear is that code decay will, assuming it hasn't already, cause the product to become more unstable. Is that the um, uh, a an element of the description you were just giving a moment ago? Yes. I mean, it's saying that um, with that number of pinnacles, the the product is becoming potentially unstable, yes. You know, you, you can't be sure that you're going to be able to correct the problems and diagnose them properly in future. I mean, I wasn't involved... I mean, as, as you know, people on the, part, on the post office side weren't close enough to these technical issues. You know, you're trying to... You're, you know, you're... you're the, the black box problem as we've described it but what I, I sense when I read this from a you know wider experience is that the pathway solution was critically dependent upon this Escher product and it, it reminds me of other situations where a, a supplier comes forward in a tender 
having a kind of a solution which they think is going to meet the customer's requirements. And they hang their proposal on utilising this product, either an in-house product, or in this case it was actually a product from Escher. So you, you, you base your design on the fact that this core product it, it, it will allow you to build your solution around it. But then you find that it's not really quite the right product that is needed for this particular client's requirements. So you're then into a process of what's sometimes called reverse engineering it or re-engineering it to meet the, the client's requirements. Now that is acceptable to a degree but once you start to re-engineer more of it, you're, you're going to end up disturbing the basic integrity of that product and complicating it. And that's what I fear happened here. The, the Escher EPOS product went through so many iterations, it, you know, it almost became unrecognisable. You've not read not the... unrecognisable, that's an exaggeration, though, but it became very different to what was the original concept. You've read the 20-page report... I, I believe. Sorry, the... You've read this 20-page report. Um, yeah, for the first time yesterday, I think. Yeah. <laughs> if you had known the information contained in it at the time, i.e. in late 1998, what, if any, impact would it have had on your own conduct? Um, because this is at still an early stage, of, y y this is still at a relatively... I mean, you're into the testing cycle, so it's getting a bit late in some ways, but you're still in a kind of early stage of testing. So you could say there may well be time enough for this problem to be solved. You know, you, I, I wouldn't say you, you would have to leap to a conclusion at this point that we're, we're you know, this is clearly undeliverable. I don't, I don't think you could jump to that conclusion. This would be a worry, and it would explain certain things, I would have been more, without, was, I don't know if I'm going to jump ahead of you, I'm, I'm more concerned that the document you sent me that, about the review of EPOS in late 1999. And why were you more concerned about that document? Because that document, which I think was, again, it was an internal pathway document issued in November 1999, where some of their technical people made a proposal that the EPOS code should be rewritten. Now, that is a huge, that is a huge recommendation to rewrite the core product. Now, that, as I, I, as I saw the subsequent documentation, that recommendation was actually turned down by their senior management who yes. thought that it would be more cost-effective to just keep maintaining it. But to, if, if I, or the really... Not, just personally, but if the post office team knew in November 1999, you know, like the month you were about to commit to national rollout, that there were people in pathway, technical people in pathway, who were so concerned about the stability of this product that they were thinking of that it should be rewritten, that... that that would have been a well a red a red flag i mean that 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 would have been very worrying uh, what what you know what decision we post office would have then have made but that that is materially significant information to have had or not had would your answer be the same if the proposal was to rewrite the cash accounting part of epos um i mean I don't understand, as you said, we, we, we didn't understand this internal architecture of the system and it wasn't, you know, I wasn't in the technical or product assurance teams that may have got closer to this. Um, if you say to me, given the problems, do you think the, the accounting aspects of the system should have been rewritten? Uh, yes, I think... You know, given what we've seen, they should have been rewritten. But when they should have been rewritten, um, you know, the answer to that could have been December 1998. 
they should have been rewritten. You know, there was sufficient evidence at that point to think, mm, this isn't working very well. You know, we should not necessarily throw everything away, but this area that is giving us particularly business critical problems, we should take a more in-depth look and not just try to fix it. Think about whether we've actually got it wrong and we should, you know, redevelop it. Can I try and draw the threads together and look at um, the penultimate paragraph of your witness statement, please? Yeah. Um, WITN 0609 0100 at page 18, please. And it's paragraph 30. You say, at the time I left Horizon, I was not so much worried as to whether there were known faults sorry, whether known faults had been fixed. It was rather that the system delivered into rollout had an ongoing vulnerability to error due to its complexity and lack of transparency. And you've explained that to us already. And then you say, when errors arose over time during live operation, as they do in all systems, it would be difficult, if not impossible, for postmasters and postmistresses to understand what had gone wrong. You've explained that to us. Would it be... Uh, difficult or impossible for Pockel to understand what had gone wrong in that situation? Uh, uh, what, what, what could have gone wrong in the live system? Uh, uh, um, I mean, you've... If I, if I just thread, I mean, I was, I was interested in what Mr. Folk said at, towards the end of his testimony, that from his perspective, he felt that although the kind of the known visible problems had been fixed at this point, he still felt that there was a certain unproven, I think unproven was the word he used, in going into rollout. I'm saying I had exactly the same perception. Um, therefore there should have been some um, activity to have monitored that these issues that have been such a problem during testing and during acceptance were showing resolution in the live environment as it was rolled out over the following 12 or 18 months. That's what and, and you would have thought that, you know, given all that we knew at the time, not now, but what we knew at the time, that there should have been some diligence on areas, you know, such as the accounting, such as reference data drops. But what? But that didn't happen, clearly, did it? That did not happen. In fact, it, it, it seems that very quickly in 2000, the, the post office senior management, the, if I'm going to, from what I've read, the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters, the post office investigations department, all came to the conclusion that this system is now working perfectly. You know, we're the only major corporation in the world that has got a 100% perfect computer system. I know that's a bit... Um, strong to put it that way, but for, for people with any IT background, to think that the senior management of a major public corporation can believe that their system is perfect is just, well, I don't know what word to use, you know, if I just said naive. That's, You've explained in your um, evidence about a lack of transparency, mm. meaning a lack of uh, ability or facility to look at see to see how the system was designed mm. and how it um, in practice operated. I'm asking when the system was um, live after national rollout, mm. did that? Um, lack of transparency or facility to look under the bonnet still exist. Yes, yes. Can I can I just add a point of 
detail here. Um, but before you add yeah. the point of detail, yeah. why did that lack of transparency or facility, as I've called it, okay. to look under the bonnet still exist? What, are you saying why did the, post, did the post office not have the ability to understand the nature of the ongoing nature of these problems? Is that yes? If, if, yeah. they, if they saw um, um, in a, a, a post office in yes. central London a, um, a balance of right. minus, yeah. minus ten thousand pounds, yeah. and um, they said, "Right, um, shall we assume that the sub postmaster stole it?" Yes. Or shall we see w right. whether there is a computer error that has caused that as an artifact? Yeah. Was there a facility, an ability to interrogate the system to see whether the minus yeah. 10,000 pounds balance yeah. was an artifact of the system? Yeah. I mean, clearly Fujitsu should have had the ability to do that. You know, they, they clearly uh, are technical people within um, Pathway Fujitsu should have been able to interrogate branch a, a accounts as part of a debugging process. So, um, but the, 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 it, you have to understand the difficulties of debugging a system of this scale in so many outlets. Uh, and this is a point I wanted to make. This is a slightly... It goes back to the point I made before lunch that the postmasters, when they had a deficit or a, you know, an unexplained discrepancy, they couldn't get anything out of the system to explain what was going wrong. Now, if you, you then have to follow this through, right? They, they, they come up with an unexplained discrepancy. They've got no idea how it has happened. They ring the help desk. They say, I've got this discrepancy. I need, I need some help to resolve it. I'm sure I haven't done anything wrong, but I've got this discrepancy. So the, the, the help desk make a note of this. You know, branch so and so, so and so, unexplained accounting discrepancy. They've got no additional information to explain that. So at, at some point in the next few days, this, this perhaps is reported into Fujitsu to cut the story short. So Fujitsu is told there's a branch that has got an unexplained cash account discrepancy. Where? Where? They have got no information from the postmaster as to what might have gone wrong and where. So where do the Fujitsu people start looking for it? I mean, in, in testing systems, a crucial ability is, is, is replication. You know when you found a fault because you can replicate it within the test environment. That, that's the way you know you're 90% forward in resolving a, a, a problem. But if you, if, you, if you don't really know what happened, if you haven't got the, the evidence around the practical business activity that originally led to the fault, um, you, you don't know what fault you're trying to replicate. So this is a crucial factor in why I think the live service support to Horizon was poor and why problems didn't get fixed over a period of years because of, you could say, the lack of transparency in the branches meant that the end users couldn't describe the problems. Do you see what the, the people follow, that explanation? Does that... Does that That's what you say in your last sentence. So a yeah. situation arose where they could not validate the integrity of their own financial information. Yes. So they couldn't validate it. Therefore, they couldn't give any uh, guidance to the support area as to where to look for the problem. And so you've got people in Fujitsu being told that there are these problems, but not, not really ha getting much help into where to look for them. And then, of course, around this, you've got the whole culture of denial that there are problems in the situation in the system anyway. Mr. Simpkins, they are the only questions that I ask. Um, thank you very much indeed. There may be some more questions. Mr. Seal. Mr. Simpkins, I ask questions on behalf of a very large group of sub postmasters, uh, mistresses, and managers. And I'm instructed by uh, How and Co solicitors. Um, can, I, can I turn, with the permission of Mr. Beer, can I turn this around? so that we look at it through the lens of your starting point in your evidence, which is that you were not aware 
that the post office was engaged in the occupation of prosecuting people. Correct. And that therefore that wasn't something that was on your mental desk. Is that fair? Yes. Now, if the system um, was purposed uh, to uh, provide evidence to investigators and to support prosecutions, would that have affected, in your view, the requirements for the system build? In other words, the acceptance criteria, the requirements being put forward to design this system? Yes. Uh, do, you, do you agree that that would have radically have affected the system requirements and build? I wouldn't say it would radically have affected it. It would have been, in other contexts, the ability for an end user department unit of some kind to um, have some audit type information to explain its financial data, you would think is a pretty standard requirement, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, so, but within the post office, it seemed, yes, we've got a system that will provide this kind of data at, Ches at the Chesterfield end, but, but what about in the branch? It was as though you weren't treating the branch as a, as a business unit. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm aware there's a whole kind of legal structural issues here. But, you know, if you are a, in some ways an independent business unit of some type, you need to have some management control over your financial information. You know, not just, I've stuck all this information into a terminal and I've got these reports out and that's the end of it. You know, you need, you would, I would say professionally that that, that that person has got to have the information to discharge their responsibilities. Yes. Do you agree that it would also have tightened up the need for robustness within the system and making sure that the system was accurately providing data? Yeah. It may have helped in the design of the system. I mean, not just, as I said, not just for the postmasters, but in testing, if there had been better analysis of what was going on within those areas. It would have been easier to test. That's a point I kind of make in my witness statement. You know, if you've got a well-designed system, it's easy to test because it's structurally clear. You know, the information flows are clear. You know, the, the numbers all tie up. Where, where you haven't got that, you're just making life more difficult for yourself in testing and then, of course, in live operation. But obviously, you understand that information that may be used in criminal proceedings mm. needs to be accurate. Mm. You accept that? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, does that of itself, against the other parts of your evidence where you've been uh, critiquing aspects mm. of testing, uh, the difficulties with reconciliation uh, between terminals mm. and the, if you like, the head office, mm. does that, would that emphasize the need to make sure that those things weren't, uh, weren't um, buggy or prone mm. to error? I'm not quite sure if... Maybe my fault in the yeah. question. Would you agree that if you had to make sure the system was as accurate as possible for mm. the purposes of uh, using the evidence from it in criminal mm. proceedings? Yeah. Would that have tightened yeah. up I mean, you'd expect, regarding... Yeah, you'd expect that appropriate due diligence, wouldn't you? Yeah. You'd, you'd expect appropriate due diligence in that process. Um, and benchmarking, so that uh, you uh, look at rollout, you test the product and retest the product through its life, do you mean after rollout? Yeah. Yeah, there's a continual... Um, yeah, I think as I said earlier, you'd expect in any business support environment that part of the responsibility is to make sure that something unexpectedly hasn't gone wrong. I mean, all kinds of things can go wrong in a live computer system. I say all kinds of things, you know, but you, stuff can happen. You know, so you have to have, you know, it'll be a normal process to, you know, monitor that, monitor that possibility. Yeah. And the, the system itself, you mentioned the role and the position of um, some of the software providers. Um, 
Now, those software providers, as far as we were aware, were never told that the system may be used for the purposes of prosecutions. In other words, that the data that's part of the system better be accurate, better be good and solid. Uh, would that have affected the way that the software providers may have assisted in relation to their double checks, fixes, uh, workarounds of the, uh, their product? Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, you're asking me to speculate a little bit on what may have been the dialogue between, you know, Pathway and Escher particularly. Um, you would, you know, no, no doubt Pathway would, would uh, raise issues on Escher. They would, they would prioritise those issues. They would uh, stress urgency. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they would do that. And if Escher as a professional organisation is told there's a problem with their product, they would um, respond to it. So, uh, you know, you, I can only presume that there was some kind of professional relationship here. Um, I mean, if you're saying we've got a particular crisis because of, you know, that, that this is really serious, this potential fault, because we, I don't know when Pathway was aware of, or Fujitsu was aware of these prosecutions taking place, but you would have thought if they, um, I mean, we're getting into deep water here, aren't they? But, aren't we? But if they, if they suspected there was a, um, an issue within the system, they should, of course, have flagged it on those supplies. But I don't have any evidence. You know, this is part of the problem. You don't really have even, you know, much visibility on what went wrong there. So, I, as you say, you're, you're, you're speculating as to quite what happened. You seem to overall agree that if there was awareness that the system was going to be used as the basis for the prosecution yes. of individual sub-postmasters, it would have affected the different issues that come up within the operation of any system like Yes, this. I mean, it, it's, once you understood that that was the potential significance of yeah. some of the horizon reporting, you know, it was, I was almost, uh, wrong, I was almost gonna, I don't wanna use the word life-threatening here, because I'm aware this is a very sensitive, this is a very sensitive area. But this is a very high bar, isn't it? in terms of integrity of data, very high bar. So you would have, what is due diligence? What should due diligence have looked like in a case of that kind? Thank you, Mr Simpkins. Anyone else? Thank you very much. I think that concludes your oral evidence. So thank you very much for coming to give it. Thank you. And can I, can I just, Mr Chairman, I mean, um, I, I, you know, like with the other people who worked on Horizon, it's, you know, like other human beings, we feel a, a grief. Um, for what happened to the postmasters as a result. And um, yeah, it's still a sorrow that the system had these repercussions. And, you know, even though personally we may feel on that project, I actually did the best to make it successful, not a failure, you still feel. Uh, you still feel that. You still feel that. So, um, yeah, we just feel, um, you know, we apologise for the consequences of what happened and obviously regret it. All right, okay. thank you. So that concludes the business for today. All right. Um, see you all at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you. It's Jonathan Evans, and Mr. Blake will be taking Mr. Evans. I see. Is it just Mr. Evans? It is. Right.